Welcome everyone, my name is Adam Savitt. I'm Director of Communications at the Center for Security Policy. I'm proud to welcome you to the fourth webinar in our Bio Threats series in support of the launch of our new book, Defending Against Bio Threats, What We Can Learn from the Coronavirus Pandemic to Enhance U.S. Defenses Against Pandemics and Biological Weapons. This is the fourth of five webinars featuring the authors of this work with the final event on national defense failures coming up on this Wednesday at 1 p.m. Be sure to register for that event at securefreedom.org. Today's panel is entitled, Why the Pandemic Must Lead U.S. Officials to End America's Dependency on China for Essential Medical Supplies and Drugs, featuring Rosemary Gibson and Frank Gaffney. Please note that you are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your text questions in the Q&A box in your GoToWebinar control panel. The event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash securefreedom and on our website at securefreedom.org. With that, I'll hand it, hand it over to the Center's Executive Chairman, Frank Gaffney. Adam, thank you. Uh, and thank you to um, you and Matt Franklin for all that you do to make these webinars uh, go uh, reasonably well, despite uh, some technical challenges, including, I think, a bandwidth issue for me at the moment. Uh, but uh, it's hopefully going to be very rich content, um, and the audio will come through uh, loud and clear. I want to thank all of you for joining us for this webinar. As Adam said, this is the fourth in a series that is designed to bring to um, a wider audience the insights of a very important book that the Center for Security Policy Press has just published. Um, as Adam has mentioned, uh, it's uh, concerning defending against bio threats. And we have all had the experience in the past few months of learning of the necessity of doing that, something that I have the feeling all too few of us, including too few in government, have actually attended to until now. Uh, we are privileged to have with us uh, for this fourth in the series, one of the contributors to that important book. Rosemary Gibson, as Adam has mentioned, uh, is a uh, policy advisor to, a senior advisor, excuse me, to the Hastings Center um, but that really doesn't begin to describe the contribution that she has been making, particularly in the run-up to and during this, well, I call it the uh, Chinese Communist Party or CCP virus pandemic. Rosemary is uh, an accomplished author. She's done research for, well, decades now into various medical issues. Uh, some of it actually has earned her um, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine for her really instrumental work in encouraging, fostering, enabling palliative care across the country. And um, this distinction, I think, is uh, just one of many that I know she deserves and I think will be getting for, among other things, the work that she has been doing most recently uh, with and since the publication of her best-selling book, China Rx, which talks about the dangerous dependency of the United States on China for medicine. This has been put into sharp relief, of course, since the pandemic broke. Um, all of her earlier uh, warnings and, and urgings for corrective action to be taken were again uh, unheeded. And as a result, we have found ourselves in an extremely serious strategic as well as public health problem, namely that much of what we need to contend with this crisis, whether it's actually medicines or whether it's personal protective equipment or other medical devices is still sourced from the same country that unleashed this CCP virus upon us, namely communist China. I have to say, I've worked with a lot of people over the past 40 years. Um, there are a few that I have come to admire more, uh, to respect more, 
uh, and to delight in working with more uh, than Rosemary Gibson. And it's a special privilege, really, to be able to interview her for this webinar and to say thanks, I think, for all of us, uh, Rosemary, for the great work that you do and for the chance to uh, visit with you about it now. Welcome to CSP's webinar series. Well, Frank, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. It's uh, really good to be here uh, today with you and those who are watching. We have a opportunity and challenge before us, and uh, we've got to got to address it. Amen. We've seen, we've seen a preview of what bio warfare looks like. Well, that's yeah. where I wanted to start, really, with you, Rosemary. Is um, what is it we have learned from? the onset and the ongoing nature of this seeming biological warfare uh, experience, uh, whether that's exactly what happened or whether that's just the practical effect of it, it certainly seems as though uh, with the Chinese deliberately unleashing this on us and certainly benefiting from it, um, there are a lot of insights into our vulnerabilities, uh, both for us and unfortunately for our adversaries. Talk about that if you would. Frank, we've seen a, a deadly virus released, escaped from, however one wants to characterize it, from a lab in Wuhan, China, and it's spread around the world. And it turns out that Wuhan is also an epicenter for manufacturing the antidotes, the treatments to care for people who are harmed by this virus. Wuhan is part of Pharma Alley in China. <clears throat> and certainly the Chinese government is aware of this. And in the height of the impact of this virus here in the United States, the Chinese government through its state-run media issued a threat that was brazen and unequivocal. It threatened to withhold critical antibiotics and other medicines from the United States. So there's a plan here. It knows exactly our vulnerabilities. And we've seen all of us how easy it can be to demoralize the population, destabilize the country, hurt it economically simply by controlling a virus that can be used as a bioweapon and our defense is against it. It's a remarkable thing that we've seen unfolding, but we have to step back and take a look at this big picture and what we've been through and what we're going through still mm -hmm. now. Before we get into a little bit of a drill down on that, Rosemary. Um, if you would, for hopefully a very small number of people on this audience who haven't already read your book, recap for us how we got to this point. How could it possibly be that the United States of America relies upon anybody, let alone a hostile power, a power that is made no secret of its well, it's people's war against us. It's uh, determination to supplant us as the world's dominant power and to destroy us in the process if necessary. Well, how we got here is uh, an incredible story that, as you say, we tell in China RX. And just to uh, do a brief recap, remember the, the shortage of, of masks, that many of them were imported from China, that didn't protect people, the N95 masks, they were defective. We received gowns that were surgical gowns for doctors and nurses that were contaminated, millions of them we got. Testing kits that were giving inaccurate diagnoses. Ventilators in the United Kingdom that were sent from China were harming people. Yeah. And of course, what wasn't reported in the media were shortages of critical drugs. So your question is, how did we get here? This has been going on, Frank, for about 30 years, beginning in the 1990s, when the United States began to outsource the core chemicals 
because what are medicines? They're basically chemicals formulated to treat disease and become what we call pharmaceuticals. So the US began to outsource chemical industry to China, including medicinal chemistry. But where we had the biggest landslide in the loss of our capability and our self-sufficiency was uh, it's very clear when we opened up free trade with China, with the US-China Trade Relations Act in 2000, and then China joining the WTO. And that's when we saw the loss of our, as you've heard me say, our last penicillin plant, our, we can't make antibiotics in this country, which are you know, antidotes to treat infectious disease, bacterial in nature. It's remarkable. We, United States of America cannot make antibiotics. No. We can't make Penicillin being a, a pretty basic, uh, you know, uh, product and so vital for dealing with so many ailments. And, and so, Rosemary, I guess what you're telling us is that American businesses responded to um, the Clinton administration's encouragement to begin doing business with China um, by not just doing business with China in the sense of selling them products, but actually moving to China, manufacturing capabilities and all of the IP and uh, know-how that goes into producing the stuff we need, including some of our most vital medicines. Is that right? Uh, that's right, Frank. It was a combination of US-based companies that, well, in many ways they couldn't compete because remember China engaged in a series of practices, legal and illegal of cartels and lawfare mm -hmm. to drive out their competitors in the United States and other Western countries and even India. This is you know, what we saw with the steel industry where China comes in and dumps steel on the global market at below market prices, driving out competitors. That same playbook has been used when it comes to the products that we need that are essential for life and essential in dealing with a biowarfare situation. And so it's a combination of the two, but it, it really took off in the 2000s. And what was lost was, it was a trade-off that was made here, Frank, that companies gave out their specifications to make their generic drugs and in, in China. And now we're seeing 10% of our generics now being made in China and many of them by China's domestic companies in return for US companies that want to sell their higher margin branded products in China. What we've outsourced to be clear is our generic drugs and our generics are 90% of the medicines we take. If you walk into any famous hospital in this country or any rural community facility, no matter who you are, rich or poor, elite or not, you're gonna get the basic generic drugs, the one cent pill, that was outsourced and China controls for right now the core ingredients and thousands of them. And they're moving up the value chain to make the finished drugs. That's where we yeah. are now. You've mentioned one problem with all of that, of course, which is the possibility that we'll simply be denied access to these drugs that are, you know, determinative, whether people live or die. Another problem, which you've also documented uh, very well, alarmingly, in China RX, Rosemary Gibson, is the possibility that the Chinese will simply adulterate. You, you mentioned some of the PPEs and other stuff that uh, has been, uh, shall we say, charitably, uh, subject to less than adequate quality control, or perhaps deliberately made inadequate, in, you know, sufficient to perform the mission. Is there evidence that the Chinese have deliberately or perhaps accidentally adulterated medicines upon which Americans are dependent for their survival? Uh, Frank, China does have a track record of producing uh, medicines and you know, food products, think of infant formula, that have harmed and killed people around the world, including hundreds if not more Americans. And that was done for economic reasons, but it's not a stretch at all then that China can uh, can use medicines as a weapon. As you say, they can 
put some con lethal contaminant in them. They can sell them without any medicine in them. Or they can uh, send, you know, target certain individuals because they're getting control of the distribution systems for our medicines. So yes, our medicines can be weaponized. And what's very concerning right now, Frank, is that since the early part of uh, 2020, the FDA ceased any on-site inspections that it does in manufacturing plants in China and other countries around the world. And when it comes to China, Is given the US State Department advisory for Americans not to travel there, it's gonna be a very long time before, if ever, frankly, in my view, that FDA inspectors will be in those plants. Here in the US, if you're a manufacturer, FDA comes in unannounced, they'll spend maybe two weeks in your plant looking at everything. It's a gold standard that this country created. Mm -hmm. But now what we're seeing in China is that I think for the foreseeable future, there will be no on-site inspections. These are really talented people. These aren't bureaucrats. These are scientists that understand good manufacturing process. And over the years, they have picked out shocking situations in manufacturing facilities in China. So they won't be there anymore. And I, th I think the we're seeing the beginning of the end of the ability of our federal government to regulate and protect the American people from substandard drugs. And for, and for all practical purposes, I say this to companies that are still buying product from China, that you have to tell the public the truth that you're buying product that are not in FDA inspected facilities, they're not regulated products, and that you will be held accountable for any mishaps that happen to the American people. There's an obvious public health piece to this, Rosemary, and and one of the things that you've written about and warned of is that it's not just at the individual level, it, it is at the level of our entire health industry that could come to a screeching halt, as I understand it, if uh, it's established that either the drugs that are being brought in here from China are um, defective, shall we say, or they simply stop supplying them to us. Um, you might talk about that, but I'd, I'd also ask you to say a word about the national security implications of all of this as well. Uh, it's something you've been uh, very clear about, but uh, again, it's not gotten nearly the attention that it needs, I think, until at least now. Yes, China can certainly withhold medicines or the core components to make them. And we began to see this, uh, Frank, during the, the pandemic when at its height. What was not shown to the public is how behind the scenes, companies that make critical drugs needed to treat people for coronavirus. This, these are not the vaccines. These are the medicines for people who are hospitalized to help them recover and go back home. Behind the scenes, manufacturers were scrambling. It was like an auction block to get the core chemicals, the starting materials, they call it, to make our vital medicines that we need in the best of times and that we need during a pandemic. No media covered that story. It's all about the masks and the gowns. But imagine the same thing was happening with the products that we need that, uh, for people to survive and recover. And that's, I think that's deliberate. Perhaps they don't want to scare the American people, but it's also hidden from the American people which I think we need transparency to tell them the truth about what's been taking place. And from a public health perspective, if you withhold medicine, within, within months, our healthcare systems would shut down. Already, uh, Frank, what hasn't been reported in the media at all is that critical drugs have been rationed. I spoke with a physician a month ago who said that he could not get critical antibiotics for his patients. These are basic antibiotics like doxycycline, amoxicillin. And I thought of the day when my parents talked about ration cards in World War II. He said, I don't know when I'm going to get any more shipments. I got my quote allotment. Hmm. So, and we've had shortages of critical drugs for more than 20 years. So this has been a systemic problem, but it's only been greatly heightened uh, because of a, a pandemic. And we can talk about this later, but it's quite remarkable that we're still seeing resistance from the special interests that have allowed these shortages to take place for 20 years, uh, who are blocking efforts to, uh, to mitigate them. 
And another mm -hmm. aspect from public health, if you, if you put a contaminant in a drug, and this is what happened uh, about 12 years ago with contaminated heparin, the Chinese were selling the active ingredient to a US-based company, and they put in a cheap substitute, and it was turned out to be lethal in high doses. And there were hundreds of people who died in this country. But how do you trace it? It's virtually impossible. It's the perfect crime. Because how can you link that it's the contaminant and then what happened to patients? Mm -hmm. The perfect crime. And so it's another way that you can cause chaos and create social disorder, not only by withholding them, but putting out lethal contaminants that yet create other diseases. And other so conditions. Rosemary, that, that has a national security implication, especially at the moment when we're seeing a lot of disorder around the country as it is, uh, not for this reason, but for others, but uh, it gives one a sense of how close we actually are as a highly civilized society to uh, things coming undone and uh, maybe even the laws of the jungle uh, reasserting themselves. Um, survival of the fittest uh, can be influenced by uh, these drugs that uh, either assure survival or don't. But come to this issue because I think it's one of your most important insights, Rosemary, is it's not just our citizens here in America, it is our military personnel, whether they're here or whether they're deployed abroad, whether they're en engaged in combat, for heaven's sakes, who are similarly dependent on China, to put it charitably, an adversary, if not an outright enemy of this country, um, might they wish to do harm to our military personnel through this uh, kind of dependency? Uh, what, this is one of the remarkable, one of many remarkable revelations that I wrote about in China RX. The title of that chapter is, So Where Does the Secretary of Defense Procure His Medicine? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that the Department of Defense, our military, our veterans, their families, are also uh, getting medicines just like the rest of us uh, from the commercial marketplace. And what I found really troubling, uh, Frank, is that even companies, some US-based companies that were selling product to our, men, to our military health system, they would not say where their product was coming from, the country of origin. They simply refused. And even the FDA didn't have data to tell the military where their products were coming from. And you may uh, recall, and I'm sure some of your viewers will remember in 2018 when there was a contaminated blood pressure medicine called Valsartan, and it was found to have exceedingly high levels of carcinogens in them, more than 200 times the acceptable limit per pill. And when I was testifying before the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission a year ago, one of the commissioners, a retired Army colonel, 32 years, extemporaneously spoke up and described how he got this contaminated blood pressure medicine where the ingredient was sourced in China. And he said, if I'm getting it, that means our active duty people are getting it. Yes. Now, again, this is for economic reasons, but without doubt, what we're seeing is China infiltrate our civilian and military healthcare systems. And it's not just medicines, it's medical devices, it's equipment, it's all kinds of um, aspects of this 18% of our gross domestic product. But in terms of national security, uh, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Or actually happening, as the case may be. And Rosemary, that's kind of where I wanted to bring us back to the book and to your important chapter in uh, defending against bio threats. Um, we're looking at an actual example of a hostile power deliberately unleashing. We can debate about whether they designed the virus for this purpose or they intentionally got it out of the laboratory, but they certainly I believe malevolently as well as intentionally allowed it to be moved offshore by the 
you know, dissemination via passengers on airline flights worldwide, but including some 300,000 of them, I think, here in the United States. We have, in short, I believe, actually been subjected to a kind of biological warfare attack. And our military, you're saying, is unprepared to deal with that, uh, perhaps with inadequate you know, protective equipment, for sure. But in addition, any kinds of medicines that might be needed to uh, mitigate the effects of these kinds of things, that is a national security crisis, it seems to me. Uh, and we need to turn now to what can we do to try to correct whether it's the public health pieces of this or the national security pieces intertwined as they are, of course, um, and and do hopefully post haste. Uh, absolutely right, Frank. I, on a positive note, it's heartening to see that the China RX message has reached the Department of Defense and others in in government. And uh, and it is true that. Uh, our military depends on China for certain medicines whose components, those medicines are needed uh, for chemical, biological, and nuclear events to protect our uh, men and women in uniform. So there certainly has been a, an awakening as to this. And so we have to move on to corrective measures. I've uh, testified before Congress and the US-China Commission several times last year and in my testimony, I recommended that how do we begin to turn this around and turn it around relatively quickly? And the best way to do that is, in my view, is to use our taxpayer dollars, which are uh, being allocated to buy medicines for our military and veterans and our strategic national stockpile. Let's keep that money here in this country and have that those medicines made here in the United States fully end to end. That way our military and would be safe, our veterans would be safe. We would stimulate uh, economic activity and manufacturing back here at home, which would be a great plus on multiple fronts, certainly for national health security and public health. And it would begin to restore our uh, capability once again. And so that, uh, and I actually drafted on my home computer a, an executive order more than a year ago to encourage Buy American for the federal departments and agencies that directly procure essential generic drugs. It's been heartening to see that that has um, picked up in terms of visibility. And there has been a draft executive order written uh, coming out of the White House. Uh, but that's been um, being held up, it appears. And I think there are special interests out there that regrettably want to maintain the status quo, maintain um, some production in China at the expense of our public health and national security, even in the event of biowarfare. It's really quite remarkable. That right, said, so let, me, let me just recap this because I, I think our audience needs to understand that this is, as you've made clear, a national security problem of the first order, a public health nightmare, and the sorts of corrective action that you're talking about, Rosemary Gibson, that would enable our country to wean itself from a dependency upon a clearly unreliable and, oh, by the way, hostile source is being held up. What do you mean it's being held up? And where is it being held up? And can you give us some insights into who's responsible um, with a bit more precision? Because I, I'm sure that most of our listeners, like me, want to do everything we can to get this fixed and, um, and you know, hold accountable at a minimum those who are impeding that. 
Frank, one of the actors that is opposing this Buy American executive order is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And they certainly represent the interests of multinational companies that do business in China. And they have come out with um, regrettable statement. It's really, uh, really quite remarkable. There was a headline in one story that came out, Buy American will actually cause more harm than good. Think about that. Yeah. And other comments, we have nothing to worry about. We can do 70% of our pharmaceutical manufacturing here in the US. Those articles are written by lobbyists and communications firms, not people who know anything about the marketplace and the global supply chain. And by the way, let me say that what we're experiencing here in the US is what's happening in every other country around the world. Mm -hmm. So this is global dependence. And we found during the pandemic, we can't, our allies will keep product for themselves. So the special interests are added. And also, I it's my belief that there are companies that call themselves U.S. companies that want to curry favor with China to continue to sell to 1.3 billion people their uh, reasonably profitable brand name products there. And in return, as part, of the, as part of a quid pro quo, they're giving away what's called these commodity products. These are the generics. They're like T-shirts and and holding the line uh, to be good citizens as part of a social credit system uh, for these companies operating in China. They're basically throwing the American people, including our military and veterans, under the bus. Yeah. And you leaving said, us- You said, you said something that. really important there, Rosemary, and that is uh, that they're, they're wanting to earn credit, in effect, um, in a country that has now um, instituted a, a social credit system uh, for all of its uh, residents, uh, American citizens as well as others, um, notably uh, using these various techniques for monitoring the health of people in the country. Uh, if you don't have a green pass on your phone, you're not going to get uh, access, well, I guess, to health care. You're certainly not going to get the, uh, the the opportunities to travel, to study, to work, to maybe even get food that you require. And, and what I hear you saying is that our companies are, in effect, well, complying with, if not actually complicit in, this kind of really totalitarian system. And it's it's just staggering to think that we are relying on them to assure our health care. Uh, and, and the fact that they might be so self-interested, so conflicted in their interests, to be rather uh, more interested in playing with the Chinese than with uh, their countrymen and women here is a staggering indictment, I have to say. Every, every time I talk with you, I'm, <laughs> I must confess, I'm more and more shocked by what you've discovered, but that they're actually driven by these considerations evidently to preclude us from fixing a problem that they've helped create is infuriating. And uh, again, I think it cries out for accountability, if not uh, criminal prosecution. Well, what A.G. Barr said about companies that are effectively lobbying for China is a thin line between that, especially since China, the Chinese government started a social credit score for businesses operating in China. So they have to, Amer U.S. based companies, I won't call them American companies, but U.S. headquarter companies uh, uh, want to gain social credit in a country with 1.3 billion people, which is a huge mm -hmm. volume of customers. The U.S. market is basically tapped out, but in return, not only are they um, they're basically blocking our access to essential drugs, mm. and that's a, a dynamic that absolutely uh, that absolutely must change. But what mm. we are seeing is that some movement to get around this blockage and the special interests that want to maintain the status quo and. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do. And I, I think I've been very impressed, Frank, on a positive note that the uh, leaders in the Department of Defense and many people there who I've had the privilege of uh, talking with uh, 
see this as a threat and are doing what they can uh, as quickly as they can to mitigate it. And I think to get that, what, what we need though is this, here's why this Buy American Executive Order is so important. If you and I want to set up a manufacturing plant in the Midwest, what we need are customers. Mm -hmm. And the current system, the current buyers and the current players, they don't want to buy, they will not want to buy a product you and I want to make. They want to stick with their existing suppliers in China and elsewhere. So the right. Buy American Executive Order would require the DOD and the VA to favor a domestic company, to give them priority. And especially when the FDA is not doing inspections over there. I'd mm -hmm. like to see- This is eminently sensible given what's on the line for those uh, Department of Defense and Veterans Administration you know, uh, responsibilities. But, but Rosemary, what you, what you just said is, is something that really um, caught my eye here. Uh, you're telling us that this executive order is clearly needed um, and, and urgently so. Uh, I, but I did wanna ask you about uh, this recent action uh, with the Kodak plant. Uh, not in the Midwest, but up in upstate New York. And I know you were heartened by that. I've heard you talking about it on Fox News and elsewhere. Um, give us the quick rundown on that bit of good news and, and to what extent does it uh, make even more the case for the, the larger executive order effort? Uh, yes, a good news was announced uh, last week with uh, Kodak, now Kodak Pharmaceuticals, uh, getting a a very substantial loan from the Development Finance Corporation. This is a newly named group, used to be the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And the thought was, well, why don't we invest in America, not just uh, in, in other countries? What a concept. Is it, what, a, what a concept. And so Kodak Pharmaceuticals, it turns out, people wonder, well, why Kodak? It turns out they have in, extraordinary uh, chemical manufacturing capability, 16 million acres of office space labs reactors, they even have their own power plant and uh, wastewater. And it's all still there, even though the company right. went through a very bad time. And they have experience in advanced manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that loan, uh, they'll be um, used under the Defense Production Act, there'll be opportunity for them to produce critical ingredients, the things that we're now dependent on China for, that Kodak will ramp up production right here in the United States. Fantastic. And it was fascinating to see that the Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, joined a White House Manu uh, Office of Trade and Manufacturing Policy uh, Director, Peter Navarro, mm -hmm. in Rochester. They were there together. So it's clear that the Department of Defense uh, sees this as an opportunity. And frankly, uh, what it is, it's a workaround. The existing system of special interests that don't want to serve the American people, including our men and women in uniform. Yeah. But it's a great step forward. It's going to take a while for them to ramp up production. But once it gets going, it's a very, very positive development for our country. But I think there is something, an action step, uh, Frank, for those who are uh, watching this yes, uh, webinar. Uh, I think it would be do? great to have retired military to write an open letter to the, to the President of the United States saying we need to have that Buy American Executive Order as an urgent matter of our national security and to protect the men and women in uniform. I think it's personally, as a citizen, as a taxpayer, outrageous that companies are blocking the access of our military and our military healthcare system to quality medicines made here in the United States for their own self-financial interest. Right. And they're putting- and of course, our as, as you said- They've already put them at risk. That's a subset of the larger population. I mean, every American, whether Absolutely they're right. veterans or family members of veterans or something else, they're all being screwed. And people on Medicare, people on Medicaid, all of them. We are all being thrown under the bus. But I think of a group that's active, aware of what's going on in the world. And if anyone is interested, maybe we can work on this together. I would love to see, Absolutely. I think it's profoundly effective, an open letter to the president to, lay, to say why this is important and why that executive order needs to be signed. We'll, we'll take this on for action. Uh, the Center for Security Thank Policy you. sponsors uh, an, an effort, as uh, you know so well, Rosemary Gibson, called the Committee on the Present Danger China. Rosemary is one of our founding members, I'm proud to say. I'm the vice chairman of it under 
Brian Kennedy's chairmanship, and uh, we would love to help with this as an effort. Uh, we've got the ability to help uh, get large numbers of people um, plugged in uh, to give them a chance to sign on to letters like this. So we will definitely get behind this, Rosemary. Um, I know we're going to want to take some questions from people listening, um, and I just want to conclude this part of our conversation by saying you have made the case, it seems to me, that both in general and most especially in the context of bio threats, that this is a national security challenge of the first order. Uh, we need to attend to the public health concerns, of course, as well, but we are laying ourselves bare to still further threats from this quarter, whether it's literally from communist China or whether it's from all of the other people who have access to the kinds of techniques and technologies that would enable them to use biological warfare against a country like ours, to see how devastating it can be. When you think about it, it's without firing a single shot that we have suffered so acutely. So, Rosemary, you have sounded the alarm on this long before it uh, was upon us. Uh, sadly, your warnings were not heeded, as I said, but they are being now quite clearly. And I want to do a particular shout out to Dr. Peter Navarro, an old personal friend of mine, and I know a man you've worked now closely with in his capacity as the senior trade advisor to the president of the United States. Um, we need to support Peter Navarro and his vital work in this and so many other areas. So uh, we'll be we'll be working with you on that as well. Let me uh, uh, invite our colleague and, and uh, moderator, Adam Savitt, to um, put some questions that have been sent in, I'm sure, from our audience. Is that the case, Adam? Sure. Yep. We got plenty. Um, start with the million dollar question. Do you believe that this was planned, uh, a planned release or an accident? I let those. I will let those who have studied that aspect of the virus uh, to comment on that. Uh, my emphasis has been on a different subject. What do we do with the people who are harmed by it? So I would welcome uh, their commentary on it. I, I would just volunteer my own assessment, and I'm a layman, not a scientist by any means. Uh, I think the Chinese Communist Party has, for decades, had an illegal biological weapons program. They forswore it in the Biological Weapons Convention. Uh, another of our colleagues on the Committee on the Present Danger of China, J.R. Nyquist, has written a fascinating piece at uh, Epic Times um, back in February, actually, talking about a, uh, a transcript of a speech that was given back probably around 2000 by the then Defense Minister of China, in which he talked about how the former Secretary General of the Chinese Communist Party, Deng Xiaoping, back in 1992, I believe, formally launched a biological weapons program for the purpose, according to this uh, defense minister, for the purpose of depopulating the United States so it could be colonized by Chinese. Now, that may or may not have been what actually went down in this circumstance, uh, but it's, I think there's evidence that the Chinese put that coronavirus to, uh, together, did engineer it for the purpose of doing harm, not just as an experiment, not just for defensive purposes, but actually doing harm. And one way or the other, it did great harm. And my own feeling about it is this is a biological weapons attack. And we'll leave it to uh, the historians to sort this uh, as hopefully more information is made available by the Chinese to confirm that. Thanks, Adam. A slowdown in non-COVID medical procedures caused a big part of the massive GDP shrinkage in the second quarter. Do you think this will bounce back fairly easily or have hospitals lost a lot of conventional capacity? Uh, the, uh, the question is right on target. There was a loss of... Um, ability of uh, hospitals to perform essential medical and surgical procedures during the coronavirus. I think the biggest challenge uh, faced now is that people may still be uh, scared uh, to receive, to go to hospitals, to go to doctors, to receive needed medical care. 
I'm concerned less about the impact on GDP as I am concerned about the health and well being of the uh, subsidiary effects of this pandemic. Uh, there was an op ed written by, uh, I believe, the head of the Mayo Clinic and maybe Cleveland Clinic about the 100,000 plus deaths that occurred because people didn't have a timely cancer diagnoses. Mm -hmm. They were had suffered chest pain, but were too afraid to go to the doctor. Or in some cases, they couldn't get their high blood pressure medicines and other medicines. So without doubt, there have been subsidiary effects of this virus in terms of uh, deaths. I heard in Washington, DC, overall deaths, not just coronavirus, were up 40%. And so uh, we have very serious health consequences uh, that lie in the wake of this pandemic. And I believe any action we take on shutdowns and so forth need to take a broader view of all causes of um, morbidity and mortality and making decisions about keeping the economy open or not. And Rosemary, do you think that there will be a bounce back if we get to a place where the virus is uh, stabilized, shall we say, if not actually defeated? Well, I, I think it's uh, true that uh, people need medical care. People get sick mm -hmm. and uh, they want to access uh, quality medical care as long as that, as long as, but we have this fear factor out there that's so pervasive. And if we can cut through that, I think we'll get back to normal. But I think part of the concern here is that I gather quite a number of hospitals have actually shut their doors. They've been bankrupted by this whole uh, affair. So the, the question is, uh, will those future medical needs, and you're certainly right, there will be plenty of them be met. Uh, there's a lot of unused capacity also now, but you're right in certain communities that they might be standalone facilities, particularly in rural areas, they've had an extremely tough time and also some urban areas. So we're gonna have to come out of this just like a lot of other businesses are in this country. Yeah, amen. But the good news is that the news is that they will always have customers because people have sure. cardiovascular cancer and other conditions that need treatment. That's for sure. Adam, uh, go ahead. Several, several questions along the lines, but just to combine, you know, uh, why is it taking the pandemic to make the U.S. realize how much they rely on China, and would it be possible to create a disincentive for the outsourcing? How do we keep it from migrating overseas again? That's a great question that even I asked myself when uncovering the, uh, this story for China RX. <coughs> someone asked me, uh, so why did it take someone like you, a private citizen, to expose this? And I, I think the answer is quite clear that there are special interests that like to retain the status quo, that didn't want the American people to know that their generic drugs, about 10% of them now, are coming from China, fully made in China and how dependent we are. What I'm uh, quite surprised about is we have a whole biodefense establishment in this country and none of them ever address this issue. Yeah. Even today, former FDA commissioner Scott Gottlieb is out there talking about how we have to have better predictive analysis for pandemics, but nothing about what we need to do to restore our supply chain. You have mm -hmm. conflicts of interest with former FDA commissioners serving on the board of companies that uh, li like to preserve and protect their current outsourcing arrangements with China. It's a very serious problem. I think no. there's a disincentive. You know, Senator Cotton has a bill that said within five, and there's been a number of bills with actually some very good provisions in them on both sides of the House, Democrat and Republican. And he said within five years, we should not have any medicine that has any component made in mm -hmm. China. That's an aspirational line in the sand, but it's the kind of thinking that we need to remove uh, this vulnerability, which is only going to worsen. Right. And I'll, I, I, pre I predicted this would happen in China RX, that in the event of a global pandemic, the U.S. will be waiting in line with other countries. That mm -hmm. is happening. I also predicted that soon the FDA will not be able to protect the American people from substandard essential drugs. That mm -hmm. we're already seeing happen. And the third prediction, that if we don't fix this, what we've seen now with coronavirus, will be a blip on the screen compared to the profound impact we'll have on millions and millions of Americans. We have to fix it because the consequences could be so adverse for our country. Rosemary, when we first met, um, thanks to our mutual friend and colleague, Kevin Freeman, um, I remember being so impressed by what you said about this particular problem. But 
also about the fact that you managed by focusing in on this particular manifestation of a much larger problem of having offshored so much of our productive capacity to China in most cases of, uh, of a dependency that we've taken for granted. This particular dependency is so shocking and so obviously unacceptable to Americans whose lives are now at risk that all of the other ones, whether they're silicon chips or flat screen displays or rare earth minerals or drywall or baby formula or what have you, suddenly now should be in sharper relief. And again, I, I think the point of uh, the Buy American, uh, American First Executive Order is, is so obviously needed is we've got to really correct these kinds of uh, mistakes that again in industry after industry after industry a similar kind of calculation was made and fairness to some extent with government encouragement to just go with the the low bidder That's and right. uh, forget about the necessity of providing for ourselves here at home with with actual reliable you know productive capacity and quality control so thank you for helping raise the larger alarm in the process as well. Adam? Thank you, Frank. Yes, this is a, a what I call it, as you've heard me say, a kitchen table issue. And mm -hmm. I, I think it helps many Americans who don't understand Huawei or haven't been paying attention to steel or aluminum, what's happening to those things that we need for an industrial base. This brings it home to the average person. It does. In a, poll conducted a number of years ago, actually paid for by the industry. 94% uh, of Americans don't trust medicines made in China. That's why they've hidden this from us. And right. that's all the more reason why we have to bring it back. Yeah, and, and just on that point, Rosemary, I think you touched on this a moment ago, but just again, hidden it from us is literally what they've done. If you wanna know where your medicine is provided, how, how do you find that out? Uh, there's a, an appendix in China RX where we list uh, some websites. There's one on uh, the, within the NIH Library of Medicine called Daily Med. That's one source. Another option is just to call, uh, get a picture of the box when you hmm. get something from the pharmacy and call up the name of the company on it and ask them. Some will tell you. And it was hmm. shocking the names of some companies that wouldn't tell. And I named some of those companies in China RX that would not but, tell. But the point is, it's customer. not printed on the box that it comes that's, from China. Right? That's deliberate. And what's even more shocking, Frank, is I was at a visiting a hospital in the mid-Atlantic re region while writing China RX, and this very large Western generic drug maker would not tell a hospital that buys hundreds of millions of dollars of product each year, hmm. would not tell their customer where a, an oncology drug was manufactured because there was there were reports of this oncology drug being contaminated and and the FDA blocking it because of concerns about it. Yeah. And they wouldn't even tell their institutional customers. So I remember uh, visiting with a with a doctor medical doctor uh, after meeting you and and reading the book Rosemary and asking him if he knew where the drugs that he was prescribing were coming from and he was uh, sort of ashen faced and, and somewhat, uh, uh, shall we say, uncomfortable saying it, but he didn't. And I think there's no reason they should know. Most of his yeah. And I would also say that more than 10% of generic drugs tested by an independent a lab up in New Haven found that more than 10% of the generics that they tested did not meet US standards. Yeah. They didn't, and that's all, I believe, for economic reasons. Some of them had contaminants in them because of cutting corners. Yeah. So, well, but here's another right thought, now. Rosemary. It, it again, it could be purposeful too. I mean, Absolutely. you can't rule that out when you're dealing with the uh, Chinese Communist Party. Adam, let's see what else we can cover before we have to close. For over two decades, China is known for criminal forced organ harvesting, which also has been concluded by the China Tribunal. Yet many U.S. transplant hospitals and doctors are cooperating with China. Should the U.S. decouple from China in all medical disciplines if there's simply no common ground on medical ethics? Mm, great question. Well, um, that's a, a situation that's um, a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. 
And what we're seeing just today is the tip of the iceberg in our conversation about the Chinese government's infiltration into our medical care system. And you know, in Australia during the pandemic, there were 34 hospitals owned by a Chinese investor who said to the Australian government, well, I'm gonna close them down in the middle of this pandemic unless you pay me more. Yeah. And in Canada, there are it's a chain of nursing homes that's actually owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Imagine living in a nursing home in the United States owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Right. So we absolutely need to decouple so we can at least preserve something that's dedicated to the uh, to the safety and health and well-being of our of our people. And mm -hmm. I'd like to, we need to get CFIUS, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Where are they? They need a whole uh, 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 focused effort in the healthcare sector to prevent these investments, certainly in the delivery of care and so much else. And we haven't and, even uh, talked about the theft of intellectual property. Right. That may be for another day with you, Rosemary, but uh, let me just make a point about this, if I could. Um, it's been described as organ harvesting. Uh, I think it's actually organ genocide because invariably what happens uh, typically to political prisoners in China, whether they're Falun Gong practitioners or Uyghur Muslims or political prisoners, is they're murdered for their organs. And sometimes they're even having those organs extracted uh, while they're conscious and, you know, witnessing the removal of uh, their vital parts. This is happening on an industrial scale. It has been for years. And the question is so apt because Americans are, at least some of us, uh, complicit in this, they're they're sending patients overseas to get uh, uh, a kidney or a liver that they might otherwise wait a long time for. They can get it ordered for them. Because going back to what I said about that social credit system, uh, it's got a health component. It's got everybody's DNA mapped. It's got your blood type. It's got uh, other medical uh, characteristics that can determine whether you, prisoner 1030509, are going to be selected to give your organs up involuntarily and forcibly, of course, um, to some American who wishes to buy them. For profit, for the Chinese Communist Party, to be sure. In fact, there are, there are high-speed uh, lines, or at least there have been in the past, uh, allowing people to get into China if they're coming in for organ transplants. So this is this is another crime against humanity. Uh, Rosemary Gibson, it, it is another example of what we're up against in the form of the Chinese Communist Party. And it is why we believe so strongly at the Committee on the Present Danger of China that there's really no alternative to the end of the Chinese Communist Party. I think of it as really doing to it what it has now done to 150,000 Americans and countless millions of others through this disastrous pandemic, the CCP virus. Rosemary, I know I must to take a, a, a quick moment to just say a farewell to our audience. Let me do the same. Uh, I want to emphasize this is uh, the precursor to the fifth and final of the programs in this webinar about the bio defense threat. Uh, problem that we need to address so urgently. And I thank you, Rosemary, for the extraordinary contribution you made, not only to this book from the Center for Security Policy Press, which can be found at securefreedom.org, but also to the larger educational effort that you've been so valiantly making. Thank you. It's good to talk with you, my dear. Thank you, Frank. Uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Frank. I would be uh, grateful if folks wanted to follow me on Twitter at Rosemary100 for the latest developments. And we'll talk offline, Frank, about uh, ascertaining interest among retired military and other uh, Americans who are, want to send a message to the White House that we need to have that by American executive order signed now. Absolutely. We'll be on it. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. And now, over to you, Adam. Well, uh, you can check out an archive of this uh, video at securefreedom.org. It should be up later today uh, in the afternoon, as well as our three previous webinars. And make sure to sign up for our final uh, webinar in this series, which again is Wednesday at 1 p.m. Uh, lessons to be learned uh, in the 
defense policy regarding the bio threat uh, from this pandemic. So thanks very much. Have a great afternoon.